In this video, we're going to look at some electrodes that are commonly used in voltammetry experiments. In cyclic voltammetry, the electrodes are stationary. They're connected by some wire to a power source and are usually embedded in glass or some insulating polymer. The working electrode itself is usually a disc that's shown here at the bottom of the electrode. Gold, platinum, or carbon are popular. Here we see a gold electrode on the left and a platinum electrode on the right. Graphite conducts well enough to make a good electrode, but there are some problems with its reproducibility. This is another type of carbon electrode that's known as glassy carbon. It has an extended conjugated pi network similar to graphite, but its structure is more like ribbons of condensed rings rather than extended sheets as you have in graphite. This material is non-porous and provides a more reproducible surface. In most cases, we would like to have the reaction of interest occur at an inert electrode. We call such a, an electrode the working electrode. It merely serves to transfer electrons to or from the species under study. By that, I mean the electrode material itself should not be easily oxidized or reduced over the potential window that we use. We also don't want the electrode to oxidize or reduce the solvent or buffer components. The ideal working electrode will allow us to apply either a large positive or negative voltage with no background current in the absence of the electroactive species. We say that such an electrode is polarizable. In practice, these materials are polarizable up to a point. Platinum, for example, can scan out in the negative direction to about minus 0.7 volts at a pH of 7. At that point, we begin to reduce water and produce hydrogen gas, and the current goes up exponentially. At the positive end, we are limited by the oxidation of water to form oxygen gas. So we have a clear working window of almost 2 volts. Glassy carbon has a little wider range, but just slightly beyond plus and minus 1 volt. In addition to the working electrode, we need a reference electrode to complete the circuit. The reference provides a benchmark or a voltage that we can trust. When we apply plus 1 volt to the working electrode, we want all of that energy to go into creating a potential energy drop between the working electrode surface and the solution. Unlike the working electrode, the reference should be totally non-polarizable. That is, when we apply voltage to the cell, the reference electrode should provide any current that is needed without budging from the resting potential. So if we push it one way or the other from its resting potential, the ideal reference electrode will transfer electrons so readily that a new distribution of charges is never able to build up at the electrode solution interface. If it maintains its potential, then all of the applied energy will go into the electrode solution interface for the working electrode. Reference electrodes are actually half-cell reactions that are isolated in their own chamber. Let's look at a few examples of reference half-reactions. The ultimate reference electrode is the normal hydrogen electrode. It's the reduction of hydrogen ions to hydrogen gas at a platinum electrode. Physically, this means we bubble hydrogen gas at one atmosphere across a platinum plate in an acid solution. Here's the Nernst equation that represents the potential that builds up at that electrode. Since we can't measure the potential of a single electrode, this is merely assigned zero volts by definition. As you might guess, bubbling one atmosphere of hydrogen through a solution represents some safety issues, so most chemists like to find something that's a little bit more convenient to use as a reference electrode. Here is a more practical reference reaction based on the reduction of silver chloride to metallic silver. Both the oxidized and reduced forms are there at the wire surface. Since chloride is a product, it shows up in the Nernst equation for this half cell. At one molar silver ion activity, we get a reference potential of 0.222 volts. 
a popular way of studying the chloride activity is to use saturated potassium chloride, and that produces a reference potential of positive 0.197 volts. Another popular reference electrode is made from a mixture of mercury metal with the solid calomel mercury salt, as pictured here. It's common to use a saturated KCL solution in contact with this as well, in which case it gives a potential of 0.241 volts. Of course, the fact that there are multiple reference electrodes to choose from raises the question, how does one compare results for experiments that were performed at different reference electrodes? Let's look at that. Let's imagine that we measured the formal potential of an iron complex using a silver-silver chloride reference electrode with saturated K4Cl reference solution. What would the voltage have been if we had used a normal hydrogen electrode? We know that silver-silver chloride is 0.197 volts more positive than the normal hydrogen electrode. Our iron complex is more positive than the normal hydrogen electrode by this distance. So we see that we should sum these two values to get the potential for the complex with respect to the normal hydrogen electrode. Now let's think about using these electrodes in combination to do a cyclic voltammetry experiment. We might use a setup such as this, where the electrode on the left represents a working electrode, where the active surface is a disk pointed downward out of our view. The reference electrode is a silver-silver chloride electrode, and here, to minimize contamination, a salt bridge is used as a double junction. So we have our two electrodes. Uh, what's this third wire hanging in solution? This is usually a platinum wire. It's known as an auxiliary or counter-electrode. We've added it to carry the current that might otherwise have to go through the reference electrode. If the working electrode is reducing something, for example, electrons are moving into the solution at that end. Something else will have to remove electrons to keep the balance in solution. If the rate of electron transfer at the working electrode is only on the order of nanoamps, the reference electrode probably can handle that without budging from its reference potential. If it gets to be greater than that, then there's some risk we'll distort the experiment, and it's better to carry the current away with the help of an auxiliary electrode. But just how is that done? This diagram represents the three electrode cell. The circle on the right represents the working electrode. The arrow represents the reference electrode, and the counter electrode is shown here. We use an operational amplifier to apply voltage at the counter or auxiliary electrode. Let's imagine we've programmed a voltage of V1 to be applied to the non-inverting input of this op amp. We know that the amplifier will work to provide V1 at the other input of the op amp. So the auxiliary electrode is being driven to whatever voltage it needs to to provide a voltage near the reference electrode of V1 plus the reference voltage. Of course, we're interested in measuring the current through the working electrode, so we attach that to a current follower operational amplifier. Since the non-inverting input of this current follower is attached to ground, zero volts appears at that input and also at the other input. Now what's important to drive the reaction is the difference in voltage across the solution working electrode interface. So it's the voltage drop that's important, not the absolute voltage. Perhaps it'll be a little bit clearer if we use a concrete example. Our reference voltage is plus 0.197 volts. Let's imagine that the voltage V1 is plus one half volts. So the solution side of the electrode solution interface will be 0.697 volts higher than the working electrode voltage. Let's think about the system from the point of view of the working electrode. What does it see? Looking into solution, it finds that it's more negative than the solution by 0.697 volts, or actually minus one half 
of a volt with respect to the reference electrode. It's this voltage that we actually plot as the applied voltage in our experiment. So the voltage that appears on the horizontal axis is the voltage at the working electrode with respect to the reference electrode.